Good afternoon and uh, welcome to everyone uh, to our conversation on uh, Kosovo. Uh, my name is Valeska Esch and I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Germany and I am delighted to welcome uh, Veton Suroy today. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know him, um, he is a journalist, writer, politician and civil society activist from Kosovo. He was a leading figure in civil society and politics in Kosovo already during the 90s and among others served as senior negotiator at the uh, Ramboye peace talks and senior member of the Kosovo negotiations unity team uh, between 2005 and 2007 uh, during the negotiations which in the end uh, led to Kosovo's declaration of independence in 2008. Uh, he was the founder of the independent weekly and later daily Koha di Tore, which is still one of the leading newspapers in the country. He is the founder of uh, uh, KTV, uh, the leading independent national TV broadcaster. And I I'm sure many of you know him also as a vocal commentator of political events in the country. Uh, Vitam, we are really delighted uh, to have you with us this afternoon. Um, before we start talking about the recent elections in Kosovo and what they mean, allow me just a few brief housekeeping remarks. We will conduct this discussion in the form of an interview and I have a whole list of questions prepared, but um, I, look, I look also forward to receiving um, questions from the audience. So the Q&A function is open, um, feel free to send in your questions and I will try to pick up as many as we can. Uh, given that many of us spend a lot of time on Zoom or other platforms these days, uh, we would like to keep this, this short. We have about 45 minutes, um, so without further ado, let's turn uh, to this afternoon's topic. Yesterday, 13 years ago, uh, Kosovo declared independence from Serbia, but it has been a political, politically turbulent country ever since. It has seen three different governments in the past one and a half years alone. It has seen six parliamentary elections in its young history, and there hasn't been a government which was able to serve for a whole ter term so far. So I would start exactly here and ask you, Veton, why, why has this been the case? And maybe you can also comment a little bit on what was special about the previous elections. You, sorry, you need to unmute yourself. Thanks. We have uh, had this turbulent uh, period of time because we've had a um, quite a, a successful process of state capture by uh, the parties that have ruled uh, Kosovo. And like in any feudal system and state capture is uh, about uh, something like a feudal system in which uh, the feuds are being distributed. Um, the moment there was friction between different uh, interests of the fuse, then we had to go to uh, new elections. Um, this election is the first probably post-feudal election in which we've had a wide distribution of votes uh, throughout the country. We've had a um, electoral revolution, if you will, uh, in which uh, Vendosia won um, probably uh, 50, per 50 plus percent uh, of the vote. We will know that in the following days and weeks in which the diaspora vote and the other votes are being uh, counted. But uh, it is an extraordinary uh, election because it will probably be a paradigm shift in Kosovo politics in the future. Um, for many years, the the, the political parties that were part of the, uh, of the ruling uh, elites uh, either counted on Dr. Rogova, uh, the leader of the, our first president, or on the KLA. So the narratives were either Rogova and KLA. And for the first time, we have a movement that is actually talking about jobs, jobs and justice. And this is uh, Vendosia. Uh, we have two more demographic uh, revolutionary uh, uh, statements, if you will. Um, in the Vedvendosia vote, uh, in the, when people were asked who would they vote for, 52.4% uh, of the votes uh, were women votes for uh, Vedvendosia. 
whereas uh, there were high majority votes of men for other parties. So this is a women revolution, if you will, in, in, in the vote in, in Kosovo. And uh, in, in uh, distribution of age, the, uh, the, the majority of the voters of the Vidosi were at 18 to 24, uh, whereas the majority of the LDK voters were 65 and above. So, so basically, given given that we have um, such a strong majority of Advendosia, it almost seems like the government formation process will, will be an easy one. Do you expect it to really be as easy, or or how to, how are your expectations uh, for for the government formation process? As as things stand now, uh, without the the vote uh, of the um, uh, of the diaspora, Advendosia uh, will probably count it. 56 or 57. Uh, with the diaspora vote, it might reach 59. Uh, to form a government, they will need 61 votes. Uh, already, there are non Serbian minorities who would be willing to engage uh, in a government. And in any case, a, a, any government in Kosovo needs to have at least a minister who is from the non Serbian minorities communities. Uh, and a member of the Serbian uh, community. Um, because uh, there's a perception uh, from both Kurti and everybody else that Lista Srpskaya represents uh, Belgrade uh, directly, there will probably be uh, an invitation for Lista Srpska to be in the government, but not to form a coalition uh, in order to do it. So I don't think there will be a big problem uh, or I don't foresee any problems in government formation. Uh, the problem of course, is that all of this will happen in a very compressed uh, time period because we will have a prolongation of next three to maybe four weeks in which votes are certified that would put us into the second or third week of March uh, and uh, the new president needs to be elected uh, by the first week of uh, April. Uh, so even though we will have a government being formed rather easily, that might not be the case with the election of the president. And could you explain maybe to those not, not following Kosovo uh, events so closely, what happens if, if a new president fails to be elected? Well, because we have this such a complicated system, complicated even more by continuous interpretations by the constitutional court, that the president needs to be elected by uh, 60, in the third round by 61 votes. But in the first two rounds and the third round, there need to be 80 MPs sitting and voting uh, in the parliament. Uh, and that will give then the opposition parties the uh, capability of uh, blocking the election of the president. Now it's a, you know, it's a blink uh, game who blinks first uh, because uh, the, 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 the Pedvendosia can, can claim that it does not want to uh, listen to the opposition, that they have a constitutional obligation to be in the parliament. And the opposition can say, well, if you don't listen to our proposals, we will not be in the parliament. So we will see who blinks first. Do you expect opposition to, to be in the position of blocking this, giving, given, given the landslide victory that Vat Vendosia had, or is it politically not, not, not necessarily opportune for, for opposition parties to, to basically, in the end of the day, worst case scenario, trigger another election? There will be many scenarios. And of course, self-interest of MPs might be one scenario. Uh, you know, If you get elected an MP, it's not that you want to put that at risk and go into a, a new election. That can be one factor. Um, there can be other factors involved in this game. And one of them is what happens with the LDK because uh, in the next uh, 30 days, probably, we will have a process of 
new uh, a new leadership being formed in the LVK um, before uh, we have a vote on the president. Now, that in itself will uh, demonstrate a bit of where the LVK is going and where it is going on the presidential vote as well. You, you just mentioned um, in, in, in your first answer um, on, on what was special about the elections, this perspective or this ticket that Vendosio ran on, on, on jobs and justice. How do you see the expectations now of voters and, and how are they going to be able to fulfill these expectations given difficult circumstances, not only related to elements of state capture that you mentioned, but also given the dire economic situation only made worse of, by the pandemic? How do you see this play out? Do you think they will be able to deliver? I think that the dossier will have not only high expectations, but high level of, of popular support for a period of time. Um, and this was seen in last year when they formed the government and they started with uh, removing uh, political influence in the, in the boards of, of state-owned companies and things like that. Uh, I, I think what will, I think they will have a series of, of these kinds of actions in which they will clearly show the degree of state capture and that what they are doing about it. Um, I think the question of, you know, when they say jobs and justice, you can't create jobs nor justice from one day to the other. Uh, but you can clearly show the path towards forming both jobs and creating justice, rule of law. And what I think they will be trying to do is to show a initially to stop the the hemorrhage of public money, which is continuously uh, part of this uh, state capture and feudal system in which the few redistribute the public money for their own needs. Uh, I think they will show that public money does not need to go for construction of highways and things like that, in which there's a high level of corruption, but move it towards education and education for jobs and uh, um, training and uh, health and and so there's plenty to do, but there's also a capacity of transformation because of the of the bad governance that we have had through. All they need to do is to show a bit of decency in governance, and they will have high support. And how do you how do you see um, the the dialogue with Serbia develop? Uh, Ibn Kuti has already made uh, quite clear that he does not consider this among the first priorities of the incoming government. Um, but obviously, international expectations are very high on on finally being able to continue the dialogue um, in hopes of finding a solution. How do you think he will approach the dialogue? I think he will approach it. Uh, seriously, um, I think he, uh, you know, he, what he's been saying is that my voters uh, don't have this as a priority. Uh, so I need to focus on my voters. They gave me the vote for, you know, if in the top, not in the top 10 priorities of people polled on election day, uh, jobs was number one, um, health was number two. The rule of law was three, education was four, visa liberalization, COVID, et cetera. And then behind the environment, you have uh, relations with Serbia. Uh, but I, I think it's clear for everyone that the, the question of negotiations is a high priority. It is a high priority in the messages that were sent uh, by President Biden and uh, the messages that were sent by uh, Jose Borrell. Uh, so yeah, I think the, there will be a, an understanding that there needs to be a serious uh, uh, addressing of this issue, that this issue needs uh, a serious uh, uh, concern. Uh, but it is also, I think, uh, in the making to, to give a message that this process needs a serious restart. It's not, you cannot go into a continuity. You know, this is uh, the, the negotiating process uh, between Kosovo and Serbia 
happened in a coincidence that may not be a coincidence, but it is a coincidence that it, it, it started in 2010 or was be informed in 2010 when uh, Mr. Thatchy led a, a wide uh, um, electoral fraud uh, in which he was invited uh, to ne negotiate uh, and in which the Council of Europe uh, uh, created a document by which he was accused of monstrous crimes. So uh, uh, against humanity. humanity. So uh, during these 10 uh, years, we've had a intermingling of different interests and different narratives linked either to negotiations or to crimes or to, or, or to organize crime. Uh, now we have a discontinuity. Now you do not have, for the first time, a government which can be blackmailed uh, and blackmailed on these issues of crime or, or crimes against humanity or things like that. And so in the negotiating process, I think this is very important because it, it allows the parties to express themselves more freely. Before b before we we uh, talk further about uh, the allegations among others against Hashim Thachi, I would be uh, curious to hear your take also on Ibn Kurti's position on the question of uh, unification with Albania. I'm I'm sure you are aware um, how how much concern these these kinds of statements that we've heard from him in the past um, have caused. Well, not only here in Germany, but 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 across many other countries as well. How do you see this, especially since he he just recently, a couple of days ago, um, uh, said in a in, in the Euronews interview that I'm sure you've you've seen as well that in a potential referendum he would vote for unification with Albania. How does this play into into his approach of the dialogue? I I don't think it's uh, it's not even in the first 20 priorities or 30 priorities. Um, and of course, it will emerge anytime you ask anyone about unification. Uh, but if you see if you see particularly the way you got to the answer, you will see a bit of the reasoning. You know, he was asked about unification and he said, well, you, you know, our constitution does not allow it. And then he was asked, but if your constitution allowed, would allow it, and he said, well, we don't have a referendum law. And then we said, but if you had a referendum law, I said, well, if I had a referendum law as a citizen, I would vote for unification. But in this kind of string of questions and answers, you don't see a idea that is moving policy in that direction. You simply have somebody who is satisfying the curiosity of uh, the journalist uh, about a, his own personal uh, uh, vote in a in a referendum, and such you can find anywhere in in Kosovo. I don't think the question of I think the vote in Kosovo and Vendosia leading that vote was for functionality of a state of a democratic state that needs to be ready for Euro Atlantic integration. I think that would encapsulate uh, the mood uh, of the vote and the strong demographics uh, with it. Can you explain to us how popular overall this, this idea of Albanian unification is? We have seen in the previous election campaigns, Ramos Haradinaj also playing with that idea based on the notion of if Kosovo continues to be isolated, we don't really have another choice. We've seen PDK also advocating for, for more engagement of Albanians in Preshevo Valley in the, in the south of Serbia. Is this a popular idea in, in general in Kosovo, or, or is this really a marginal issue like, like you just uh, described? The polls show continuously decrease of that kind of orientation. And the, the narratives in politics, if you, if you look at it in earnest, you see it continuously as a threat. You know, as if, you know, if you don't do this, we will do this. But who cares if you if you engage in one or the other, and it's not that it, it, has, uh, it has neither a stabilizing nor destabilizing effect inside. It's, not, it's a non-issue. The issue is not you know, how to uh, become part 
of uh, some community, some other state. You know, we spent many, many years uh, becoming independent. And uh, you have now a, not only a generation, but basically a, a whole movement of being built on independence, being nurtured on independence. Uh, and suddenly you tell them, wait a minute, you shouldn't be independent, you should be part of something else. Um, and that doesn't work. You mentioned earlier the allegations against Hashim Sachi, and um, a few months ago, he and also Kadri Veseli, another leading figure of, of PDK, were indicted by the by the special court in The Hague. Um, when that happened, we saw even, even strong critics of these two figures criticizing the fact that they have been indicted and, and the special court itself. Could you explain for the audience a little bit the role of the special court, what you, what you in the midterm see, um, as, as a development, um, as, as a consequence of these indictments, what, what effect will they have? Well, there are, th there are three <laughs> elements to the story, at least three. Uh, but the first one is, well, we have the, the legal aspect of it and there's uh, nothing to be discussed. There's uh, an issue that is being raised. And I think many people have accepted it as a legal issue. So nobody disputes the court anymore as such. In fact, it was disputed. The last time it was disputed was by Mr. Tachi himself sending a letter to Secretary Pompeo of the Trump administration. So the, the court as such was adopted. It's part of the legal system that's going on. The second point, of course, is the question of politics and how it reflects or in an unfinished conflict. We have an unfinished conflict with Serbia. We have not reached the point in which both sides have agreed on a future on, on, on normal relations. And in that unfinished conflict, we have combating narratives. Uh, and it, in those narratives, you have a revisionist narrative in Serbia in which increasingly there are people who are saying there was no genocide in Srebrenica, there were no crimes in Kosovo. Serbia was simply defending itself. Everybody is against Serbia. And then you have 20 years after, you have opening up of the question of eventual crimes committed by the KLA in, in, or members of the KLA or commanding the structures of the KLA, however you want to put it, but not the organization as, as such, uh, of eventual crimes committed uh, during the war. So 21 years or 22 years uh, after the war, we now have again, uh, these competing narratives of war uh, on the Albanian side and on the Serbian side. And the third element is, that emerges and that will emerge is that we will be entering the process of facing the past, of confronting the past. Uh, and it is a very delicate process. And it's, it's a very delicate process, of course, uh, if you have a, a, something going on in the courts and we will have for two or three years now, discussions of this or that particular crime being committed uh, during the war. And on the other side, we have this whole new revisionist uh, movement in Serbia that does not confront the, fat, the past, that is trying to rehabilitate somehow even the, the people who, were, uh, who, were, uh, who went to, 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 to jail in The Hague, uh, being, uh, being tried for crimes against uh, humanity. And, and speaking of Serbia, you, you mentioned earlier um, the, that the Serbian list is seen as, as being directed by, by Belgrade or as being Belgrade's influence um, in, in Kosovo. Um, and uh, at the same time, the Serbian list got 99%, I think, of, of all Kosovo Serb votes in the previous elections. 
Um, President Vucic has rolled out even a vaccine strategy that includes the, the north of Kosovo. How do you see Serbia's role? Because on the other hand, even, even um, in the Atisari plan, it's always been foreseen that, that obviously links cannot be entirely cut. So, so how do you see this evolve and in, in, in a positive scenario? Well, in a positive scenario, you know, this is a negative scenario in which we have, forget Lista Srpska and, uh, and Serbia, just it's the same thing happened in Croatia with HDZ vis-a-vis -vis the, the Croats in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So you have this notion that somehow the center, uh, the ethnic center will control the, uh, the other parts of, of that ethnicity. And this is not good for democracy. Uh, one thing is to try to keep links. The other is to be a direct controller and administrator of your kin uh, uh, throughout. This is not helpful. Uh, it puts Lista Srpska not in, uh, to be seen neither as Kosovar Serbs, uh, nor, uh, for that matter, as Serbs in, in Serbia. They, uh, when they go to Belgrade, they, they will be always Kosovar Serbs. But when they are in uh, Pristina, they will be perceived as uh, envoys of uh, President Vucic. And that does not help the Serb cause. Um. In the same in a Euronews interview that I referred to earlier, um, I, I bin Kurti also stated that there is no need for reconciliation between Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo. Do, do you share that assessment also given what you just said? Or how do you see also um, the, the responsibility on the side of Kosovo Albanians to, to better include Serbs in, in Kosovo in, in, in their uh, decision making, in, 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 in their strategies also for the, for the entire country? Is there a unifying element somehow that you see? I'm not. I'm not sure he said that, but but in any case, I think I'll take the question to 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 move it a, a bit to another level. The question is, how do we come from narratives of war into narratives of peace? We have been spending twenty and something years. There are kids now who are born after the war. And they have been given continuous narratives of, of, of war, both on the Albanian, in Albanian language and Serbian language. And, and there are kids now who have been, who have grown up, who have participated in, in elections, and who do not get the basic message. And the basic message is that we need to have a peaceful region, a region that cooperates, people who create conditions for communication between themselves, people who create a freedom of communication on, on all. And this is not a project yet. We are still at the level of narratives of war. And, and of course, everybody has his own grievance in this war. And, and you know, we have 1,600 people who are still missing. And this is terrible for, for both societies. So we need to engage in a reconciliation that builds on narratives of peace, that views war as something bad, not as something that has, has brought this or the other political result. So what are your expectations for, for an incoming government? How, how they sh should they approach this issue? I think they should, they should widen the the, the notion of negotiations with, with Serbia. Um, I think the restart should look at it in a, uh, in a way in which we transform this conflict, in which we get to a point in which we not only resolve the issue of relations between Kosovo and Serbia, but we engage in transforming memory uh, in which we try to understand that, that getting to the point of war was probably the worst thing that can happen between us. Uh, and this is a, this is, you know, we can resolve some issues next year, but we will, we will be having to resolve issues for, for the next 20 years. We need to build the culture of peace, uh, the way other people who have been at war in Germany, France, other people who have been at war have created. 
speaking of a culture of peace and and you mentioned you mentioned uh, countries uh, within the European Union let's let's look at the role of the European Union in Kosovo um, the EU itself, at least from my perspective, hardly played a role in, in the election campaigns in the programs of, of parties. Why is that, given that, that, that the Kosovo population, together with the Albanian one, is, is the most pro-European, I would almost say, across Europe? Why was the role of the EU so little discussed in, in the election campaigns? Well, because there is no unified EU uh, notion. You know, there's... Uh, uh, there's an EU notion of, of aid, and, and of course, Kosovo has been the biggest recipient of that aid post-war. There is this notion of ULEX, which is not, uh, does not have a very high authority. It's not that many people will recognize ULEX as a very efficient uh, organization. Um, and then there's EU as a, a, an, entity, an entity, visual entity, that will not grant visa liberalization. That will that keeps Kosovo isolated. Uh, it, you know, it's the same EU that's that keeps. And of course, it has kept corrupt official officials, corrupt corrupt politicians, uh, continuously promising that visa liberalization is the next thing to to be. When that should have been something that was not actually not negotiable. It's a technical issue. Not a. It should not have been a political one. Uh, and then there's the EU uh, of five non-recognizing countries that doesn't recognize Kosovo. So there's not a one EU, there are two or, or many EUs uh, in, our, in, our, in our perceptions. And the way there's not a unified view of EU on Kosovo, there's not a reciprocal view of, of Kosovo towards the EU. There's a reality that has sunk in that uh, Kosovo's ability to be in the EU uh, is nowhere near, uh, near the, is the region, you know. Uh, in 2003, with the Thessaloniki uh, summit, when the promise of, uh, of the European perspective was first given for the countries of Southeastern Europe, many of us were counting on 10, 15 years of integration, you know. Uh, the, the, Pessimists would say, oh my God, maybe the worst country in the region will be in the EU by 2020. I'm not sure if we start with a realistic approach today that we will be seeing any country from the region being in the EU in, by 2035. And this then gives you that kind of distance uh, of the EU. What would the EU have to do in your view? And, and also obviously considering that it's, it's not a unified actor, it has to reconcile 27 member states positions, but still there, there's always room for improvement. In your view, what is, what is it the EU can do realistically speaking to somehow merge also these different Im Im impressions of the European Union into one and, and gain a, a bigger role again? Because I understand that there is a lot of disappointment, especially over the visa issue. Well, the, the visa issue should not even be an issue. It's, it's not something that should be even discussed at the political level. It should, be, it should have been a, a way of the EU saying, you know, we recognize you as fellow Europeans, period. Uh, you, you know, you are here as, you, have this, you should have the same liberty as the Ukrainians and the Georgians or the Moldovans. Um, um, let alone the countries, the, the surround, our neighbors, you know, why is Kosovo, uh, what is in the function, functions of Kosovo worse than in, in the surrounding countries that would not allow it to liberalize this? But beyond this, uh, the EU as a whole, all member states of the EU should have recognized Kosovo. It's not an issue, you know, we raised this issue when we declared independence and and I talked directly with some of the countries, including Spain, and the response at the highest level was, we have a problem in terms of international law, but if the, if the International Court of Justice uh, gives you right, then we will, who are we not to recognize it? Well, the ICJ gave its opinion uh, on the legality of, uh, of the Declaration of Independence, and these countries have not reacted. So the the question, the, the, there is no uh, 
dispute on independence. There's, I don't think anybody realistically in Serbia believes that Kosovo will somehow de-recognize itself, will somehow say, oh, we're sorry, we made a mistake on independence. I think we should be part of some other country. It will not happen. And so the question is not whether Kosovo will be independent or not. The question is whether Kosovo will be functioning as a European state capable of integrating itself in the European Union and NATO and capable of communicating intensively with its neighbors so that it is able to do so. How, how do you see the U.S. role in all of this, uh, given given the high popular support for the United States uh, for for obvious reasons in in Kosovo? And how would you also um, evaluate the the recent um, change in in presidents there? How is this, in your view, going to affect the situation in Kosovo? The dynamics also between the EU and the U.S. and 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 certainly also prospects for the dialogue, given that. President Biden has made very clear that, that he does consider it a priority. Well, uh, I think you can, you can judge the, the, the sensitivity uh, of transatlantic relations on issues like Kosovo. Uh, lacking a clear transatlantic uh, view on Kosovo, it either stagnated uh, during the Obama administration or it was uh, diverted to adventurous uh, roads during the Trump administration, including the, the, the question of uh, territorial, uh, the, the land swap that was being discussed uh, under Madame Mogherini and with the blessings of uh, Ambassador Bolton. So the change in the US administration is beneficial for Kosovo because it is beneficial for transatlantic relations or vice versa. Being beneficial for transatlantic relations, it will be beneficial for Kosovo as well because we will have the US and the EU in a, again in, a, in the old plan of making or new plan or however you want to put it in new conditions of making Europe uh, uh, free, uh, of, of, of making it functional, of making it um, dynamic, uh, of uh, getting over the conflict, of giving closure to conflicts and in, in engaging all of these countries and peoples of the region in a process of, uh, that is, is mutually beneficial. Allow me, because we only have a few minutes left, to, to take also um, a few more questions that are coming in from our audience. Um, we have a question uh, which picks up um, what you mentioned about uh, state capture and, and fighting uh, state capture. And um, the question being, how is, how is Vedvendosje going to be able to dismantle it? And how can we also support them in dismantling these structures and in, in fighting for justice, especially looking at what happened, for example, in the vetting process in, in Albania, which, which in the end of the day rendered the Albanian justice system dysfunctional for a while. Um, yeah. So, so how is this, how is this going to, to work out? How is he going to be able to approach this? Well, the first one is not to repeat uh, Albania, it's to try to, I, I think, I think people in Vendosia and, and people in civil society do have an idea of, of how to proceed with it. I think the EU can help um, and countries, mem member states can help in, in with expertise uh, in trying to, to develop something that is much better than, than what happened in Albania. Um, the, 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 but more importantly, it is, I think, uh, to support them in this, uh, trying to clean out the house and trying to clean the house in, in terms of, uh, of these, uh, of where the accumulation of public money is and, and that redistribution is going into the pockets of, of feuds of parties and, and individuals linked to parties, I think, you know, the, the British, for example, had helped, the, the British embassy had helped for many years uh, in trying to be present 
uh, whenever members of different boards were elected. And whenever uh, the British felt that the, the elections were not fair or not, they simply did not participate further, given the signal. Now, for people in organized crime, whether a Brit participates or not is not really very uh, important, but it should become important when you start actually uh, pinpointing and naming and shaming people who uh, are actually uh, disturbing a process of, of betting or process of rule of law. Thank you. Um, let me throw a couple of other questions from the audience at you that, that are not necessarily linked, but I would throw them at you together uh, just in the interest of time. Um, one is related to, uh, again, to intra-Kosovo re uh, reconciliation, and we have briefly talked about it earlier. Um, and it says that Alvin Kurti has rejected Lista Srpska as a partner for, for, for this, but he would rather approach um, other groups among Kosovo Serbs. How, how do you see the prospects for this? Um, another question relates to what you said earlier about the, the high numbers of women also voting for that Vendorsia and the fact that Yosas Osmani was um, the most voted uh, politician in the previous elections. Do you see this as an indicator for, for gender emancipation in, in Kosovo? And how, uh, what do you think will happen when the great hopes for change that are being put uh, on the on, on Vet Vendosia and their partners, um, if, if they are disappointed? How do you see this play out if it happens? Well, let me take the, the woman question first, because I think it's very important. The, the 2019 elections uh, in Vet Vendosia, all the women elected in the parliament by, from the Vet Vendosia list uh, gained their votes uh, on their own merits. So it was not based on this distribution, this gender uh, distribution in the parliamentary vote. As you know, every third MP uh, in the list needs to be, or candidate in the list needs to be a woman in our, in our system. So sometimes a woman who does not have sufficient votes will simply be elected by being in the list in that particular order. All of the women uh, got uh, elected on their own merits, and I think uh, we don't know yet. But from from the polling on that uh, exit polling on that particular election day on St. Valentine's, uh, the the there's there was the majority voting for women might result in more women. Uh, elected in the Vendosia list than the 30% that is being designed by the system, which means that we might even think of raising this bar higher. Uh, and uh, I, you know, a discussion should start and maybe will start in the society of having a 50% uh, distribution in mm -hmm. parliamentary and in, in the electoral uh, lists, which will be very, very good for emancipation, necessary for emancipation of women, because in the present stage, I mean, the, the, those who have been hurt most in the war period and the post-war period in, in the occupation by Milosevic are the women. And, and now, you know, 78% uh, of the women are inactive in terms of the job uh, market. And this is tr playing tremendously bad for the, the society as a whole. When in the 80s, we had a totally different trend of women being integrated into the job market, being educated, uh, and, and, and it was a sign of reform of the society. So I think we might be on that, on that curve and hopefully we might move forward. The, the question of inter-ethnic relations in Kosovo is I think once the new government demonstrates that Lista Srpska might represent the interests of Belgrade, but not necessarily of Kosovo Serbs, uh, a, a dialogue at the local level uh, will uh, immediately, I think, be there uh, to, to be conducted. Um, and I hopefully, I, you know, people who have been rabid nationalists in the past have have changed their position. So it's something that 
that comes with the new new realities. Um, I, I think, of course, everybody will be busy, and this will be a very busy political year because we will have also uh, local elections in in the fall, uh, and that will change a lot of the political dynamics inside the country. Uh, but I think it will be very important uh, actually to engage in this inner dialogue in, in the country. But there was a third question, which I... Yes, the, the third question was, what do you think will happen when the great hopes for change are disappointed? I, as, I, as I said, so many things have gone bad here that being this decent in government it means a lot. Uh, and it, it will be a, a big uh, change from what we have had um, now, until now. Okay, I would like to, to, to end our conversation with, with a final question, looking, looking again a bit uh, in the future. Um, where do you see Kosovo in, in four years, assuming that we now have a government that, that might, uh, for the first time, actually finish its term? What, what do you think is achievable in the next four years, and, and where do you see the country? I think we can, I think we can uh, uh, reach a, a historic agreement uh, with uh, Serbia. Uh, based on mutual recognition, uh, based on the need for uh, interdependence, uh, intercommunication. Um, I think that uh, Kosovo ought to be ready uh, for NATO membership. Uh, and uh, I think this will, to a great degree, uh, change the architecture of peace and security um uh, in the region um and now uh, i think in four years the discussion between kosovo serbia bosnia etc will not be a, about identity politics uh and of course there will be plenty of war narratives going on and, and god knows we we still watch movies from the second world war in throughout europe uh, or on the Second World War uh, throughout Europe. Um, it's part of our collective memories. But, but uh, a lot of the focus in, after the, these four years might be actually on new generations uh, trying to broaden up uh, their capacity of communication in economy and culture and in all the other areas uh, beyond the narratives of the past. So I take it you have an optimistic outlook into the future. I've been pessimistic for so long. I cannot afford it. I think that is a perfect uh, that that is a perfect ending to our conversation. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for your time and and for sharing your thoughts with us. I apologize to everyone whose questions I I couldn't get in uh, because of the time. Vetan, thank you, thank you very much again, and um, we we are I'm sure we are following events uh, in the next weeks to come closely, and uh, we're hoping um, that you will, in the end of the day, be be right with your optimistic outlook. Thank you very much. As you see, even the sun is shining. Thank you. And and it just came up, it seems. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>